Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to Chattering with Nicholas Vince. And this week, I'm going to be talking with Sarah Daly and Laurie Brewster, who I'll introduce in, couple, in just a couple of moments. Um, before I do, I just wanted to firstly give a, a big shout out to all the guys at Celtic Badger Media. Um, many you, I haven't really had a chance to post much, but I've literally got back from Ireland yesterday evening. Uh, so that I could go do two things, uh, do some pre-production meetings on my two short films, which we film in three weeks time, gulp. And then I wanted to see the three don'ts, uh, directed by Paddy Murphy, uh, written by, um, uh, Brian Clancy, uh, and, uh, sorry, a whole load of Celtic Badger. Basically one of the funniest films I think I've ever seen. It is hilarious. Um, just, weird and wacky and deeply, deeply funny. So keep more news on that coming soon. I'm hoping to, hoping to get the guys onto the show in the next month or so uh, to talk about it and how, you know, what they've been doing to actually bring together their first movie. So huge thanks to them. And then a very quick update on where I'm up to on my two films. Literally, yes, well, Friday afternoon, we realized that whilst I was there that we'd lost the, the location I was intending to film my two short films in. Yay! Um, that was interesting. So Saturday morning, I was scouting out a different location. Unfortunately, uh, Paddy uh, Murphy, who I, I the same, um, one of the lead uh, directors of uh, Celtic Badger uh, had a backup plan. So we went and looked at that and I think it's going to be a much better location. So we're fine, except that it's about 20 odd miles from where the original location is. So yesterday we, I was dashing around, looking at the location, deciding that's what we're doing, rebooking accommodation, letting everybody know etc so it's been really interesting but kickstarter followers back as we'll get a proper update with some photographs and then uh, yeah more details about that um and incidentally a few people now uh, I don't know, four or five people have actually inquired about even though the kickstarter is over can they still contribute the answer is yes um all you need to do is have a look at the kickstarter campaign have a look at the rewards have a look at what's left and uh if you want to contribute and if you want to get one of the remaining rewards just message me via facebook uh, or contact me via my website and we'll sort out something via paypal so yes there are still opportunities uh, to claim some of the uh, remaining goodies for that one <sighs> right i'll breathe now um <laughs> let me introduce sarah and laurie hi guys Hello. hi <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? Great, Nick. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Good. A fatigued, but you know. I'm okay. Fatigued. I have a cup of tea, so that's always good. <laughs> I, I know. I've just. I literally just finished drinking my cup of coffee, which Craig beautifully supplied me. I'm now on my cold, wa ice cold water. Oh. Yeah, you know, just to just to keep me going through the thing. Okay, so we're here to talk about the black gloves. I will also talk about uh, one of your other projects, uh, which is for We Are Many, um, a little bit later on. But let's how what's the update? Oh, I've just got a message. Okay, guys, can you just do me a favor? Just introduce yourselves. Hi there. Well, I'm Laurie Brewster. Uh, I'm the director and a producer for The Black Gloves, and I help uh, alongside Sarah Daly to run a company called Hex Media that produces and distributes unusual alternative horror films. Uh, yeah, and I'm the, the writer. Um, I work with Hex Media, and I also do some co-producing and uh, whatever else needs doing. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay, well, that's... Okay, I'm just getting messages from Craig at the moment. We appear to be having, and I have no idea. Apparently, we can just see me, oh. but we can't see you. And i that's really interesting. I've not had that one before in the slightest. Okay, so let me just see. Craig, can you hear Laurie and Sarah? You can hear them fine, but you can't see them. Hmm. Yes. Because I can see you, which, which is 
just bizarre. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's weird, yeah. Yeah. Because you should be able to see you now. Can you just see me talking about you at the moment? Yeah. On, on YouTube, On yeah. YouTube, yeah. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. That's... That's... Okay, that is literally, I have never had that happen before. I mean, I've had people not being able to get on, but I can see you fine, and we can hear you fine, but I can't see you. Okay. Sorry, to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's just going to be strange uh, in that case. What I... We could try and reconnect if you want. You can just, let's just try and reconnect. You've got the link there on Facebook and so on. If you just... Uh, make, yeah. Just... Yeah. Yeah, Give, I'll let you let you hang up because if I stop yeah. you, then you won't be able to get back on. So if you want to hang up and then just try again, okay. Apologies, folks. As I say, I've, that is just strange uh, that we can hear them but not see them because I can see them fine. Uh, so we're they're just going to try the link again. And sorry, whilst I'm, I'm going silent, I just want to make sure that I can see their Facebook just in case they message me whilst they're trying to reconnect. Right, okay, let me try. Okay, it takes a little time for it to come downstairs normally. Okay, so, Dorian, Dorian, Sarah, oops, no, you've disappeared. Oh, are we back again? Oh, 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 are you back? You're back again. Now, can people see you? This is the question. Craig? Nope. You're just seeing me. They were there. Okay, well, we were right, well, we'll come back again once they No, 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 no. Hold on. Yeah. Craig, what are you saying? You can see them. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, there we are. Okay, great. We exist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <was reassuring. laughs> Craig has just shouted upstairs, you both look very sexy. Oh, thanks, Craig. I'm sure you do too. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I think that's what he's saying. He may be saying something else, but I can't quite hear him because I've got my earphones in. But I, I you know, I'm not going to argue with that statement. So, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so what we were saying. Um, Okay, so you're in the middle of the Kickstarter campaign at the moment. What what I was curious about is, this is your third campaign. Uh, what is, are you doing anything differently than you did before? Well, every Kickstarter campaign, you learn new, terrifying and horrifying lessons and what to do you know, to make the campaigns more effective. Um, one of the advantages we've had is because we've distributed the Unkindness of Ravens and Lord of Tears, we've managed to build up a, a great team of folks that are passionate about our films. They've backed us before, and what they've done is they've, managed, they've helped us to build a, a momentum which has helped to attract other folks, especially because this campaign is our biggest yet. And so when you see such ambitious uh, campaigns being done on Kickstarter, you need that extra sense of credibility. We've also got some great uh, executive producer friends that have come on board early as well. So between big pledgers and smaller pledgers, all of them equally important, it's, it's helped us a lot. Yeah, and I think um, like every time you do a, a Kickstarter, about 10% of the things you do work and 90% of them fall flat on their face. <laughs> um, so it's learning what things really work and where what what the best way to spend your time is um, versus the things that maybe look like they're having great effects but don't really lead to much. Yeah, because the thing is, out there in this big wide world are thousands of people that would love to pledge for our current film. And we need to get their support for the Black Gloves because what we're trying to achieve is complete independent film production and distribution so that we can make strange horror films that you would normally get. Uh, it's, it's only through Kickstarter and, and people pledging that it makes any of this possible. So we're trying to get better at letting those kinds of people understand and know that the campaign is out there and that they can get involved. But as you know, 
um, getting your word out there is, is, is tough because everyone else is talking about things and, and even mainstream films and things are advertising as well. Um, but, you know. Well, it's, it, it's interesting because I mean, obviously you had, I'd be curious just to know if you can share if there's anything you thought would work that didn't work. Um, is there anything in particular that you can think of that you thought, oh, that's definitely going to do, but you've learned not to repeat? Well, I mean, the the prank videos, I guess, was something that, I mean, they they did really well. We got, you know, millions of views, and you would think that that would translate into lots and lots of pledges, but it doesn't really. Yeah, that's that's right. They helped the, they helped the bet. You see, this is an interesting example, because everything's changing in media all the time. So uh, maybe about three years ago, if your video went viral, it would go viral on YouTube. But now that Facebook websites um, that might specialize in viral media, uh, it, you know, on Facebook have monopolized videos on Facebook, they can, for example, upload your content and get millions of views without people ever knowing that there was a link to the YouTube video. Right. So, and of course, these websites uh, that, that do that, those Facebook pages might not include links to your campaign or to your YouTube channel, which most of them didn't. So in other words, uh, millions of hits for them, for their benefit, and only tens of thousands for us through an indirect benefit. Whereas a few years ago, um, you could only really share video on Facebook through a YouTube link. So it's, it's a remarkable difference between having 3 million hits on your own video with them being able to click to your campaign and everything like that and them getting it. To put it bluntly, actually, if we had had all the hits that, for example, Facebook sites like Unilad had put out, quite honestly, I would expect our campaign to have a six-figure sum right now. Right, Just right. The sheer yeah. volume. No, I, I think you, you mentioned Unilad, but I think they were very good. They they did put a link on one of the it, certainly on one of the posts. They you know they they acknowledged where it was coming from, who you were, etc. Yeah, they had like a pinned um, comment, which does help. But it's still not as good as having, a, you know, a clickable button at the end of the video that says come to Kickstarter. Yeah, often because when people share the link, that pinned comment won't be there Yeah. anymore. So, so you, you don't get it every time somebody shares it on somebody else's exactly. timeline or whatever. It's very interesting. And, and you're not the first people I know who've mentioned that it, basically they're, they're taking your... It's great that they're sharing your stuff in inverted commas, but as you say, really... And, and they're not really pirating, and I'm not, I don't want to accuse people of, of doing something that. Do you think is? I, I guess there must be, hopefully some that some way somebody's going to come up with the technology to overcome that. Have you yeah, seen no. any signs of that? No, or or if maybe you just have to sort of learn what they're doing. Like why? How are they? getting the benefit of the content and maybe we should be doing more like what they're doing rather than trying to get them to do it themselves our way, to our, yeah. yeah so it's just you you have to really um keep up with all these developments but it's hard sure. <laughs> you know when you're trying to make films and do yeah. your creative thing and but you have to be an expert in so many things these days just to get by <laughs> yeah I, I, it's really interesting isn't it i think that you know the world of the indie filmmaker is the one you know you've got to be a publicist you've got to be a tech you know a tech geek you've yep. got to you've got to understand your market you've got literally got to understand marketing and the new changing world of marketing etc and all these other different roles and make films i it, you know i'm just and what i learned from my kickstarter is i'm very consciously saying to the backers listen okay i know we've got i've got your money and i'm going to be sending out some rewards and you know, start shipping rewards but not until the end of may because i really need to concentrate on the pre-production stuff now yeah, that's yeah. what it's all about you know it's, it's being able to create these creative works that we want to that we want to yeah make totally ultimately. i mean that's the thing about kickstarter it creates a unique relationship between you the artist and them the the patron really the the, the backer and it's very different to a normal customer and business kind of relationship. Um, and I think it's, it's important for the artists to be responsible for the works that they're creating to try and serve their backers. But at the same time, though, um, backers should be in it as well because they want to have a relationship with the artists, um, that they want to help support creative work 
and, and get involved. That's what they're doing by pledging. And, mm. and to be honest, it's very rare that you would encounter someone that would um, see you as a customer services department in a kind of cynical, grumpy kind of way. It, what we like from it is that it lets us actually have a personal relationship with the people that are most passionate about our work. And I think, interestingly, for independent filmmakers, being able to grow those relationships and those, those networks as well um, is key to independent sustainability. Our films have become more ambitious with each film simply because the amount of people that are interested in our work has grown, and that's been because of websites like Kickstarter and by trying to get folks there. Yeah, yeah, and no, I was very, and again, my experience, you know, I, I'm looking, for, I was just, because I had to do the change of uh, location, as I mentioned, one of the first things I had to do is, because certain of the reward levels on my, included a set visit. So I'm just really messaging people saying, I, I know I said it was going to be in Limerick, but we're now going to be half an hour away. And now I've got to think of logistics, you know, where, you know, they, because by this stage, they've already booked rooms, assuming we were filming in Limerick. So it's now thinking, okay, so how can we transport? And there's an extra, you know, of, of delivering what it is you promised and making sure that they're not put to any extra expense or, you know, unnecessary inconvenience in order to be able to do that. But we've met some re really interesting people, you know, having some very interesting dialogues with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's great. And we always sort of forget, but the Kickstarter is not just, you know, obviously a great way to, to, bring together funding for a project but it's also uh it kind of forces you to come out of your little bubble a bit and actually connect with the with you know the audience for your films and also just connect with the, the filmmaking community at large and because you can get very insular when you're when you're working especially in post-production and uh, yeah. that side of things so and, it, and with the marketplace as mm -hmm. well yeah so it makes things happen and forces you to make connections that you wouldn't normally have to <laughs> sort of. um, which is good it makes you know it it sort of creates some momentum for your project and gives you a way of telling the world that you exist almost <laughs> yeah I mean all all the more important now as well given that creatives and and folks that are into the, that kind of creative work can actually connect and make these things feasible and sustainable because at the moment with film the traditional model is you make a film you sell, you license it to a distributor, they sell it, and then you get some of the profit. And the big difference with crowdfunding and with Kickstarter is, is that it's allowing new distribution options to become available, you know, so that filmmakers can actually develop their own products in direct liaison and communication with their fans and not have what can often be a disappointing experience for some which is the disconnect, you know, where a distributor might market their film differently as they would have envisaged, or sometimes recut it, rename it, missell it, you know, all those kinds of things. I, 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 it's interesting. I was think, just thinking you really do have, uh, I'm just thinking of some certain instances where you know that they just put on the most uh, salacious possibly, or an image that implies it's a much bigger budget movie than it actually is. Yeah. And, you know, and it's, it's because, and, and to be fair, one of the reasons why you're doing that is because you're trying to market to people who know nothing about your movie via a supermarket shelf. Yeah. Yeah. You can understand why they do it, but yeah, there are problems with it in that it can attract probably the wrong kind of people to your film or people who might not be into what it really is. Yeah. And then they, you know, they're confused or... <laughs> I mean, a, a traditional distributor is normally more concerned with closing the sale with a customer than whether or not afterwards they enjoyed the film. You know, I mean, the bottom line is what counts. But for us, we're relying and on people coming back. Mm -hmm. So making sure that they have an accurate sense of, of what it is we're trying to make and trying to satisfy that is, is of paramount importance. Yeah, um, it is, it's very interesting. How how much, because I know you started a, a newsletter six months ago, possibly a little bit more. How, how have you found that's helped? Has, has that been an effective way of building that relationship? Yeah, I mean, less people than ever before are unsubscribing to it. So that... <laughs> <laughs> We have 
like a, a monthly newsletter called the Hex and Grimoire uh, that people can sign up for by going to w.hexmedia.tv. Um, they can also add me on Facebook, though, because I'll, I love chatting to our fans and they'll always get a steady stream of propaganda on my timeline. <laughs> <laughs> with, um, with the Hex and Grimoire, at the moment, it, it provides things like a little bit of behind the scenes, uh, some cool little t bits of information and we also do like promotions so they'll get like percentages of products and goodies but I'd love to develop it further as well so that it's got more candid nonsense among all the kind of businessy stuff but it's good it's good for fans of horror and especially for independent filmmakers as well that are interested in the business side uh, as well because again this is it it's something that as artists you want to learn a bit of because it lets you sell your own work yeah, yeah, no, it's very, I, I enjoy them. I look forward to reading them because I was looking at yours and I'm thinking, yeah, I think that's, I should probably do my newsletter like that. Hey, I should probably just do my newsletter. Um, actually, I'm not that far behind at the moment for my my normal monthly one. There will be a newsletter, folks, sometime okay. in May. Hopefully it should be sometime. <laughs> sometime in May, there will be a newsletter. Um, if you don't mind, I mean, one, one thing I would add about the, the product that we're making with the film, um, say for the Black Gloves, for example, on Kickstarter or any of our older films like The Unkindness of Ravens or The Lord of Tears Special Edition, they all consist of these three disc sets with about four hours of extras on each one. Um, and that's just something a normal distributor would never dream of. Uh, they mm. would never dream of taking an independent film that they would probably see as having a niche interest. You know, like, for example, a black and white film noir about an owl man or a PTSD drama that combines with no Norse mythology, you know, those aren't common sellers. So the idea of putting that out in a supermarket shelf in a three-disc set with a Blu-ray and a Julia DVD and hours of extra would be an anathema. It would be the opposite of everything they would consider financially viable. And, and yet for us, um, that is exactly the kind of love and passion that we have for our, our creative storytelling and our mythologies that we love to develop that we want to share with folks. And there is a market there that is being denied by, by distributors. They pretend it doesn't exist, but Kickstarter and us doing it ourselves and other filmmakers can prove it does exist. It's interesting because, and again, I, it, I guess it just comes back to the feasibility of, of doing that stuff from a distributor who, as you say, comes in at the end of the process, if you like, you know, they, they, if because even if you've got all the the stuff ready, you, it's still got to be edited, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then they, it ups the production costs because it's you know a, a single DVD. I know it's not that going to be that, but you know there's still all the all the production which you guys are able to do so wonderfully um, in the house. Who does all your artwork? Uh, mostly Laurie, really, and Michael does some. Um... Yeah, like for, for the Black Gloves, we, we've got Graham Humphreys to do our poster, which was incredible. Yeah, brilliant artist. Um, but that's yeah. really the first time that we've outsourced. Yeah, but the anything. packaging design was, was me and Michael mm -hmm. and, um, and comprised of uh, vintage uh, medium format photographs of an old camera from the 1930s. And, um, and then just us doing some of our magic on it. Uh, we kind of come from graphic design backgrounds and illustration and stuff. So again, yeah, you're learning a bit of everything, but um, but we just have a big passion for it because you know there's nothing more beautiful than being able to hold a tactile aesthetic object that reflects the year, year and a half of time you spent trying to produce something remarkable. And a, a digital download just doesn't really cut it. Mm -hmm. I, what I think we like is the idea that, and as time goes on, people could collect their films. And they might almost be like old volumes, like tomes, you know, um, that could be on a shelf next to one another. In fact, we try to encourage that by having Roman numerals on the spines. <laughs> of I thought that was a lovely market. <laughs> and, and it's entirely because of that, you know, you want something to represent, you know, to show at least for what you've done. It's, it's it's very interesting. That's right. I'm just typing a message to to uh, Craig whilst you were I was listening. Um, so, as you say, and, and I know because I've had the opportunity of vis visiting your wonderful offices and seeing you with, with the stuff ready to go and ship and, and, uh, and so on. And I think one thing actually I would like to come back to is uh, this came up whilst I was away. Um, 
try and just uh, what is it that um how do, do you value that independence that you get that creative independence and i appreciate you know the great thing about doing it all yourself is you answer to yourselves if you are working with a big studio for example or something like that do you see that ever becoming a, how do you see that going forward in the future do you always want to maintain that um con creative control over your product or do you see going off and working for other bigger studios uh well <laughs> <laughs> not an, an easy question obviously i mean i think we're probably on the same page with this yeah. um basically producing a fe making a feature film is such a time consuming experience that f for us and, and with so much passion and everything that if it wasn't for something you really believed in um then wow you know that's a, quite a bit of your life that's been put away and it's kind of a different experience because when you work with because I, I mean i've done freelance work with bigger companies as a producer um, so normally you wouldn't do the whole thing yourself, like what we would do. We're there for pre-production, shooting, post, everything, taking it to market. And if I was hired as a producer or as a director, uh, I would be there for a bunch of like maybe three months in terms of being involved on set and off set. Um, or say, for example, as a writer, I might be commissioned to write a script for another director or producer. Mm -hmm. So we're not, um, I wouldn't say we're, we're totally we're completely precious in so much as that we wouldn't work with other people and and look at realizing creative visions um that other folks have ideas about but at least with our films and with our company uh the independence is, is important um not not for our, ourselves though either not not for like a self-indulgent purpose but because we do care about what our fans and what the fans of the type of horror we're interested in telling and fantasy want and we know that other production companies or distributors won't cater to that. So, in other words, yeah, because we want to make films for the fans and ourselves, not just for ourselves. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you. And I just thought it was a point, as I say, it came up whilst I, it was a conversation that came up. It's come up recently when I'm talking uh, to friends making feature films, particularly when you're moving from short films, when normally you know, you're either going to finance it from your own money or via Kickstarter, but making that move into feature films, then there is going to be a different dynamic. Um, and this is something that something you know that does fascinate me and interest me. Okay, so th this is all about Kickstarter, etc. How long has been the production process for the Black Gloves, for example? The production process for the film or for the Kickstarter? <laughs> well, uh, oh, cool. okay, two, two good very, very time. good questions. A long time for both, but you know, what? Uh, I guess like pre-production pre for the Black Globes was maybe, I would say like eight months or so on and off, and then like four or five months concentrated full-time work for all of us. Um, then the production was about a month. Um, and post-production, we envisage taking us another probably four or five, six months. That kind of Something thing, like yeah. that. Um, yeah. So pretty, a pretty quick turnaround, really. But, you know, that's us working, you know, full time. Yeah, 24-7. Yeah, yeah, like 12 that... hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Or point out, you know, you're, on, you're in the office on a Sunday evening. Um, the uh, sorry one of the comments that we had came, came through and i just wanted to make sure i got this gentleman's name surname correct michael keats says laurie and sarah have an iconic creature with the owl man and they have been reliable with the last two kickstarters both with the final item and with communicating with people oh thanks michael <laughs> be my my dream as an artist michael to be reliable <laughs> 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 to be fair, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> they might say that Ben Whitley is a genius, but he won't is be he reliable? reliable like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, it's, it's important 
to keep your promises I think you know in, in every way but especially when you do a Kickstarter and people put your put their faith in you um, and that's that's part part of why we do the Kickstarters at the end as well is because we know for, for a fact that this the film is going to get completed somehow yeah, yeah but that with their help we can get it done a lot quicker and a lot better especially with the, the costs and posts start to rack up and also just the cost of getting the products made and getting it to market. So in a way with the Kickstarters, they're helping us to finish the films, but also to let the films develop and be made with these kinds of stories. Otherwise you would be so screwed, you yeah. know, you would really have to cater more to, you know, whoever was going to pay you to make the films. The folks on Kickstarter are really helping to make this whole operation independent and creatively independent. Yeah, 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 it, it, it can't be, and it really can't be emphasized uh, enough how important that is, too. And I don't want to use terms like niche or something in terms of the product because I think, particularly, you know, with the unkindness of Ravens, that is such, in my mind, that is such an important film uh, about PTSD. It's not an easy sell, perhaps, but I, I was, was talking to a friend of mine. She says, you know, I think my husband would like this. He doesn't like horror movies but it's such an intelligent movie he'd really and artistically and you know the style etc it's such as i say such an important movie okay so very before we actually move on to the film itself and let's talk a little bit about to people about what the film is about etc uh the black gloves um how long have you got to run on the kickstarter well, we have another 10 days, and they're so critical now, these next 10 <laughs> days. We've, we've managed to hit our goal, but like a lot of campaigns, we do set a goal that represents a minimum of what we would like to try and get, because you don't always hedge your bets on being a massive success. You, know, you hedge your bets on what will help us get through just. Now we've got an opportunity to really improve the quality. The, the margin of improvement that comes from beyond our goal now in the last 10 days is very substantial. And so I would urge anyone that was interested in our film and the kind of storytelling and the kind of ideology that drives our company to please pledge and get involved because the difference they can make now is ex still very substantial despite us hitting our goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 10 days, folks. Um, what are you actually on at the moment? You're not that much over the. Where, no, where are you up, up to? 52 five, I think. 52 and yeah, a half. Yeah, roughly. <laughs> yeah. And your next stretch goal is at 55, is that right? Yep. Cool. All right. So that's the next one to, to aim for, folks. But as you say, really. Yeah. Basically, if everyone listening pledges £10,000. <laughs> And we, we, we could hit our surprise goal of £680,000. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. And let's be honest, if that happened, I think chattering with Nicholas Vince would become an incredibly popular show <laughs> with independent filmmakers. But what happened? People come on the show. Oh, that would be wonderful. Uh, but honestly, folks. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the black gloves. Um, and we've, we've already, uh, uh, I was referring to um, uh, the unkindness of Ravens um, and the lead actor, uh, uh, Jamie uh, Scott Gordon, who's in that, is now in the Black Gloves. Yep, yep, we like him. <laughs> yeah. He isn't very fussy with catering, so he's very cheap to work with. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Like most actors. He lives on a diet of Kit Kats and uh, Kinder Eggs, really. It's... Chia seeds. Yeah, chia seeds and... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently you're on... <laughs> Apparently... Does that question, Nicholas? Does that <laughs> question? <laughs> it's not the answer I was kind of expecting, but yeah, it, I, I understand. I, you know, I do understand. Um, and, and Michael Keats says you're on 52,700. On the Kickstarter oh, wow. at the moment. Yes. That's more than we had. Yeah, Before someone's just pledged then. Okay. Woo, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, whoever has just pledged uh, deeply. Um, 
for Gordon is because he's he's like you um, as an actor as a performer. He's just a, got a lovely soul, lovely personality, and he's the kind of person that we want to go out with and create art with together. Skill is important, sure, but it's really the spirit of a person's candor. You know, like we want to make the best art we can, but we also want to help the best people we can and have the best time we possibly can. Yeah. You know, and that shows in the film for the fans as well. Yeah. Having geniuses and a miserable time on set doesn't produce the kind of art I think always that. No, no. So it's it's got to be a collaborative thing, really. And you want to have that feeling that everyone's there for the same purpose, which is just to create something really special. And it's not about one person's ego or one person's vision or, yeah. you know, it's about what we can all do when we come together and treat each other nicely and <laughs> have a nice time, but, and work really hard, you know. Basically like a family, really, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we like having folks work with us and get involved with us. The old folks that come back in or the new folks as well, they become a part of that. Same with the folks backing us or our customers as well. I always encourage them to get on our Facebook and to get involved just in blethering nonsense with me because... Just because, you know, it can be done differently. And so we make films differently with that kind of approach. Maybe like John Waters did something a bit like that, you know, with the Dream Team, um, you know, back in the days when he was doing Pink Flamingos and stuff like that. <laughs> he was working a lot with, like, the same group of artists and folks that were among his yeah, friends. Yeah, just like that. It's like Pink Flamingos, <laughs> <in> of <the> course. <laughs> 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 I was I was going to say like Hellraiser, Hellbound, and Nightbreed as well yeah. as the other example of that. <laughs> but, but hey, if you want to go for pink flamingos, um, and uh, a message from John Van Pye, uh, our mate who they that my caged other people's darkness behind me. Uh, well, uh, chattering works. I just pledged. Hey, uh, thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> wonderful, yeah. John. Wonderful, wonderful, John. Um, uh, and again. Alexandra Nicole Hume was in Yes, Lord of Tears. Lord of Tears. Yep. Um, yeah, again, we I mean we have a definitely a tendency to work <laughs> with the people that we like and that we know we can rely on and that are just consistently hardworking and devoted to the same thing that we are, you know, which is again just making the best film we possibly can. Um, she she worked really hard for to um, to train for the ballet for for this film. Yeah. Um, that was something really really special that she brought choreographing the the ballet sequences and um, just doing some incredible dance. Totally. And plus, I mean, as a you know as an expert in physical movement and composition and everything like that, and and a lot of horror films, you know, where you have strange movements and things like that. She does a bit of everything. Uh, but uh, yeah, like with what Sarah's saying with the ballet, um, you know, she plays a ballerina that suffered a nervous breakdown and, you know, she's got one character that's trying to help her through dance and the other character, Jamie, trying to help her through psychology, you know, and, and conventional kind of therapy. Um, but for the ballet, Alexandra choreographed original sequences and she also mastered the, the legendary 32 fuertes of Swan Lake, which yes. are the fuertes, sorry, uh, the 32 spins. <laughs> Um, which is a physical, almost a physical impossibility just for the film. So it looks it looks incredible. Of course, it's a horror film. You're not going to have wall to wall dancing, but um, <laughs> but, but for but when it does happen, it's 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 it is really amazing and magical. Uh, it was to see it firsthand when we were making the mm -hmm. film, but in the film itself, it's done. But sometimes it's really really fucking terrifying as well. It's really interesting. Because I, I think those spins are done on point, on point. Yeah, yep, it was all on point. Yep. I just like you know that. Just so that anyone who doesn't know about ballet and what that actually means, when we say standing on tiptoe, they are literally. It's not like you're standing on the curved tiptoe. You are standing on the tips of your toes uh, when you're in a point shoe. It's an unbelievable feat. Like I, every time you see her do it, it just it just doesn't even look like it should be possible. <laughs> Yeah, I tried to do that. I was going to do 14 parties, yeah, um, yeah, not yeah. 32. Like, I was quite disappointed uh, in just myself. Spinning on his bum. <laughs> 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 I was needing, I had worms, you know, it was oh, embarrassing gosh. for everyone, you know, sorry. <laughs> real horror of the black hole. I had to go see this, you know, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're just going to stop that line of questioning, really. Yeah. Just, oh. you know. <laughs> That, uh, that is absolutely because it looks so gorgeous. I mean, you've, you've shared trailer. I think there's a second trailer on the Kickstarter. 
Uh, no, it's just just the one at the it, moment. I uh, will put a second one eventually that gives a bit more detail. We'll have story, to use but... the Guillermo del Toro quote for the second. Yeah. Really, because, <laughs> because he said a nice thing about the film. He did. He did. Absolutely. And I think, you know, it, it's wonderful when that kind of thing happens. And he, he, he supports. He, he said, kind of... and I said, and I quote, I didn't hate it as much as I, I thought I should, didn't. but I didn't. Oh, an interesting quote. It's cryptic, but it's positive. Uh, evocative of Mario Baba and Michel Suave, uh, who was the director for uh, Stage Fright and a bunch of uh, cult Italian horror films in the yeah. 70s. Well, that was cool. Yeah. That was a nice day. Oh, oh yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I mean, God, Del Toro taking notice of us. It's almost as exciting as you taking notice of us. <laughs> You smooth talking person, you. Now speaking, <laughs> not, I mean the other person, and I deliberately worked kind of my way backwards is Macarena Gomez, um, who looks wonderful. You posted something the other day about how much her start the look is based on it is reminiscent of Mrs. Danvers from Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. But she, how did you get Macarena involved? Well, I mean, I, I always really loved Macarena's uh, work. Um, like a lot of Stuart Gordon fans, uh, she stuck out to me in the film Dagon, where she was playing this otherworldly sea priestess. But also, we saw her recently in a film called Mozaranis, which is uh, Shrew's Nest, where she was playing, it was a dramatic horror film, where she was playing an agrophobic uh, sister. And... She was just amazing in that. Yeah. And also some short films like Merry Little Christmas as well. Some of the most shocking, um, really quite out, out, explicit, terrifying, intense films. So she was someone that evoked emotion and rage and passion with a rare level of comparison from other actresses, I felt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was really, really incredible. Like, um, even, you know, just in person, she has an amazing charisma and power to her like we're all a little bit terrified at first <laughs> oh yeah if you, you know i mean macarena is even better at emasculating me than sarah so like <laughs> pretty good yeah and then sarah's pretty good so like <laughs> i mean macarena was something else but, but she's, she's so much fun she's hilarious um she's got such an intensity but she's also she's filthy it's great she she's, makes yeah. dirty jokes all the time dirty so. jokes smokes eats anything yeah it's great she's <laughs> um <laughs> and just she was just incredible um in in film obviously like she she knew the whole script like so anytime because you know what it can be like on a on a low budget film where you know you don't have the weather you want so you have to change things around yeah um so i was you know one evening i was saying to her oh, you know we might have to switch up what we shoot tomorrow morning um if that's okay and she said uh, you shoot anything, I know the whole script. I was like, okay, yeah. great. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, what one might well, think watching, yeah, sure, an actor should always know the script. But, yeah, they know the script, but they might not know verbatim every word of every part of the I film. Mean, yeah, just that short notice like that. Like, she had a lot, she has a lot of dialogue in yeah. the film. So, yeah, we were very, very excited to work with her, and she did not disappoint. No, she uh, and how did, you, how did you reach out to her? Oh. That was the question. Oh, your question. <laughs> what that answer, do you? Just out of you know, um, curiosity. I'll indulge you on this occasion. Um, well, we contacted her manager, um, Esther in Spain. She's a lovely lady. Mm -hmm. And um, and basically, we were just like, you know, we're producing this kind of film. We've got limited resources. We know that. Because Macarena, she does like... Uh, she's like a top Spanish star. She does like top rated TV shows over there and she works a lot in South America and stuff like that. But she doesn't work much in Britain. Um, partly out of her choice and just partly the circumstances where she's just got a lot of work on with TV shows that doesn't let her get out much for that. So it was because the opportunity presented itself and she liked the script, which would give her a chance to do something very different to what she would normally play as well, that she just, that it seemed like it was a great match. Mm -hmm. Um, her agents were brilliant, really easy to work with, which is a miracle among agents in the entertainment industry. <laughs> and uh, no, she was just really excited to get involved. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. So, normally uh, happens. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, so, give me your elevator pitch. Why? I'm sorry, we've got plenty of time to talk about it, but something I just wanted to get, make sure that we have covered is 
why should people contribute to campaign? What can they expect from, you know, what are they contributing to in the Black Gloves? Oh, who, who wants to tackle this fun one? Oh, I can tell the story if you want to tell the style and stuff. Okay. Start yeah. with Sarah. So ladies first. Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. So it's uh, basically, it, it tells the story of um, a psychologist who's become obsessed over the death of his young patient, Susan. Um, so before she died, she complained of being stopped by this terrifying figure who wore a Victorian tail suit and had the head of an owl. It would be quite disturbing. Um, so through his research, he finds that she's not the only one who's seen this figure. And his investigations lead him to a former prima ballerina who now lives in an isolated Scottish mansion with a ballet teacher. Uh, so basically, he goes there to try to help her and also to try to get to the bottom of this owl man phenomenon um, but of course it doesn't exactly go to plan <laughs> um, and yeah there's there's a lot of dark twists and turns it's it's quite a, it's a classic chiller um, that has a brooding atmosphere and just lots of dark suspense secrets mystery it's it's really all about the story with this one Right. So the, the, uh, obviously, Sarah, you, you're credited as screenwriter. <clears throat> was it your idea or it, did you just think, one morning, I know what we need to do with the Owl Man next or how, what inspired you, this particular story? Uh, it, was, it was both of us really um, thinking about how we could um, tell a different Owl Man story. Um, we pretty early on knew that we wanted it to be period set. Um, and again, that we wanted it to be sort of a, a, a very intense, dramatic character piece. Um, and again, yeah. filled with, with mystery and suspense. So the this story really started from from there. I mean, me and Sarah, we work together. I mean, me as a producer and, and Sarah as a writer. So I mean, producers are, are creative as well. I mean, you get different kinds of producers. So um, like, so a lot of my work will be as a creative producer. So I'll think of broad concepts for example, like, um, so, like, you come across Swan Lake, and then the story of Swan Lake, the villain is an owl man sorcerer. And we were like, bloody hell, that's amazing, you know, so we can take aspects of Swan Lake and incorporate it with our owl man story. Yeah. And that will let us, use, you know, work with, like, ballet, or the period setting of mm -hmm. the film, you know, and, and there's remarkable kind of things with ballet and movement and with the, the owl man and all the kind of metaphors you could play with. Mm -hmm. So I would take those kind of broad ideas and then me and Sarah would, would discuss them and shape them. And then she would go forward and develop like the, the fine detail in the stories and the characters. Though, I mean, as a producer, I might be like, hey, wasn't it cool in Rebecca when there was like this aspect? And like, I wonder, hmm. You know, and then you just get ideas from not just for obviously films, but from literature and from your own life experiences. But, but that, 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 that's how we kind of came together with it. Okay, and and you mentioned the, the the stylistic. It's filmed in black and white and looks gorgeous. And as I say, you, you very kindly showed me some uh, some of the, the the footage that you had when I was when we were up there back in February. Why black and white? Oh, it saves a lot of time in the color grading, Nicholas. You just, <laughs> you just turn the color. You know. Well, uh, no, the reason. The real it's, reason. it's a thought. <laughs> You know, it's, it's actually quite tricky to color grade black and white because you take away the color, but then everyone's faces are like dark gray and they look too dark. So you end up having to do a lot of color manipulations to bring the faces to be as bright as you would psychologically perceive them to be if it was in color. Really strange. So, it, but anyway, um, I love film noir. We both love film noir and um, horror films as well. Like, for example, like The Haunting and The Innocence as well those are like those are actually films that inspired me to become a horror director so the idea of being able to contribute something within this that subgenre of noir especially when you combine it with the resurgence in black and white horror like uh, a girl walks home alone and the eyes of my mother and even a field in england as well we thought you know what maybe there's an appetite and a willingness to accept a story that takes a classic film noir inspiration and makes it into a modern, you know, terrifying kind of psychological horror film. And um, and we really didn't know how people would react to that. Mm -hmm. You know, so far it seems to be positive. 
I've spoken to friends that are distributors, and some of them are like, yeah, good luck, mate. You know, and other ones are like, yeah, okay, you can see it. And but you do get the idea that this would never normally get made. Um, but that's why we're making it. And, um, and so far, it just seems to be really cool. Plus, mm -hmm. there's just something terrifying about what you don't see. See, with film noir, it's all about, the lighting is all about the shadow of what you don't see. You know, you're not painting with light, you're painting with dark, as it were. And the films that creeped me out the most when I was growing up were those weird black and white films that were well acted, they had some creepy dialogue, and those empty dark corridors where you just knew something was waiting for you on the other side. Films that prioritise dread and atmosphere and that growing sense of dread as well as, as a story goes on instead of jump scares and, and nonsense like that. And so that's that subgenre allowed us to do that. Right, 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 right. It looks wonderful. And I, I, was, I watched the uh, trailer that's on YouTube, on um, uh, Kickstarter at the moment, just before we started the show, just to kind of remind myself. But it's just like, I literally, and I, obviously I've seen it quite a few times now, and it still gives me chills. Um, mm. it, it, re you know, it really does give me goosebumps. And I'm really looking forward uh, to, to seeing the whole thing. And, you know, should just remind people, I, I am part of this movie as well, but um, I want to just see the whole thing. <laughs> the catering and uh, doing some of the sausage rolls and no, I mean, <laughs> vegetarian sausage rolls. We're fine as long as the vegetarians. <laughs> was... I mean, me and Sarah are both really excited and proud to be getting a chance to work with you as well on this. Uh, for I mean, for the for the benefit of the audience, we have a brilliant character, a really memorable character for Nicholas to play in the form of. Uncle Edward, you really <laughs> should be taking better care of his young young charge uh, than he does. Um, it will be a character that I think will really implant themselves in the audience's psyche with quite a horrible kind of quite a horrible chill. Um, it's very intense. But yeah, we're really excited to be working with you on that, and I think like together we're going to create a kick-ass scene for that movie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm so looking forward to this. <laughs> I should probably shouldn't get so delighted every time people tell me I'm going to be playing somebody nasty. Um, <laughs> oh, <I know. laughs> but it's just like, it sounds so cool. It'll, it'll be exciting as well filming your scene on the, basically we're on a castle ruin. It'll be overlooking the sea or a red cliff top. And of course you'll be performing in the nude. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as you've got a blanket at the, you know, the run of a moment. <laughs> nervous because the crew will be undressed as well so <laughs> we'll be in it together so <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> sorry there is as i said there's a mention there's a delay downstairs i'm not quite sure if craig was laughing downstairs about the thought of me being in the nude or the crew being in the nude <laughs> <laughs> and we'll put that thought to one side now as we uh, <laughs> the other project that I, you have been working on um and i'm filming part of uh, i'm filming a segment for uh, in three weeks time uh is the anthology project for we are many um so let, just remind folks a little bit more about that wait what's happening with that right well for we are many is a very exciting project that we've been developing behind the scenes with filmmakers, including, of course, yourself. And the idea behind it is that we're going to try and produce, well, we are try, try nonsense. We are producing a horror anthology based on the idea of, of demons. And on first impression, one might think, oh, okay, what, well, like possession dramas and things like that? Well, that, we're looking at the whole gamut of demonology from cultures around the world, or even fictional ones as well. Demons from Lovecraftian origins, as well as, say, Judeo-Christian or other religions or whatever. The whole idea, though, is that when you watch these films, these uh, short films, in similar manner to ABCs of Death, that kind of thing, it'll almost be like you've opened an occult volume of demonology, and each short is like a page in this book where you'll encounter some kind of incredible phenomena some kind of horrible entity um, and and that should be good they'll be fast paced as well they're about about four and a half to five six minutes each and um it'll be like a real roller coaster ride of up and coming creative talent uh some of them are, are more experienced we've got folks that have done feature films and stuff 
Um, there are some grandees of the industry. I think. Um, but... It's the beard. I get called grandee when because of the beard. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, if, if, and we're, we're encouraging folks to get involved as well. So if anyone listening wants to learn more about the project, they can go to w.hexmedia.tv and there's a section called Work With Us. It'll, do, it'll open a drop down tab where they can click on For We Are Many and learn all the details about uh, if they're interested in filmmaking, how they get involved. Uh, because we're also trying to match people up as well. Uh, so if some people are like, oh, you know, like I can write. And then it's like, well, okay, well, you know, this guy is looking for a writer. And we're just trying to see what can happen. I would say it's a grassroots project that's going to result in an innovative professional product that I think folks could really, really like, especially when they see my short about the demonic tree. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's going to be short. <laughs> see... You're, you're far too young, but immediately the moment you said that, and it's not about a dem demonic tree, but there was a, kid, a kid's TV program called The Singing Ringing Tree, which... Yeah, it, yes. <laughs> look, look it up online, folks. And, and I remember walking to a bar once and seeing excerpts from The Singing Ringing Tree, and it's, it's weird. It's, uh, but for enough, it's in black and white as well. Um, but and I should actually just give a quick shout out because not only am I writing and directing a segment for this, I'm act also acting in one for Paddy Murphy. Um, was it, which is a great, I've seen the script for that one, it's really great. I'm really looking forward to working on that one again. Well, as well. well, love Paddy, you know, he's he's one of the best, lovely guys that we've met in the genre, and he's such a team player and such yeah. a supporter. Um, he's a rare gem, he is a rare gem. Yeah, we, we want to help him. I mean, he's helped us, but we want to help him as well as, as, as much as possible, yeah, so as we I'm, should all be doing. I'm really but... glad we're getting to work with him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and I think it's, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier on. As I say, I, I was with, over there for the last three days. It's the Celtic Badger family. You know, they really are. They, they, they all came out um, after I'd seen the three don'ts um i kind of met a few of them online and i'm using some of the same the, the actors uh, the lead actors from that in in my short um the, the, just the atmosphere and the way they support each other is is great is really really good um i mean that's kind of the spirit of as well as, as like with what we do and it's and i think with the four we are many project especially it's the kind of it's the kind of energy we're trying to promote among all the participants um, is the kind of stuff like what Paddy's doing, what we're doing as well, this idea of working together. And with this film as well, um, for a lot of the folks, you know, they're wanting to get their stuff shown in cool festivals. And well, what better way to do that than to produce a feature film comprised of these great efforts that have a much better chance of, well, one, playing at genre festivals, but also getting a decent airplay at a genre festival. Mm. We might take the chance of being one in a thousand when you could be one in 100, say, or one in 50 with a feature film. And so we really hope that, you know, we'll be able to submit this and get it shown at great festivals like Fight Fest and everything like that when it's done as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, I'm just really excited by the whole the, the whole process um, uh, about that. Okay, we're coming to the end. Um, uh, we've got a couple of minutes remaining. Anything else... You know, I think I, I kind of asked, you know, what have you been up to? And I think I know what the answer is going to be for the next 10 days, certainly. Um, it's Kickstarter. What else is going on with you guys? Well, we've been trying out some freaky stuff, Nick. <laughs> Sarah, just slap him, please. <laughs> um, basically, we're just like, like you, you were suggesting yourself, where we're concentrating on the Kickstarter then the second that's done, all our efforts will be dedicated towards uh, completing the Black Gloves and also in managing and growing the 4 We Are Many project as well. And um, and I would say that's that's the, the main thing. Yeah, that'll be it till the, till the end of the year, really. That's our... Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of work to be done for that. And people can still get... We've mentioned your previous two films. Yeah. Um, the moment they're available exclusively through the Kickstarter, um, which is always frustrating to someone going to the website <laughs> to, to see that the button just takes them to the Kickstarter. But um, but yeah, they can get the films. Uh, they can get them with the black gloves at a discount as well. 
Um, if they really hate the look of the black gloves, then they can email me and I'll let them pledge for just one of the older films. <laughs> but I've not had much of that recently. Um, eventually, the website will be back as normal selling stuff after the campaign on the 25th. But at the moment, we'd really appreciate anyone that's interested in any of our films to pledge on the Kickstarter. Because not only is it helping to make our film better, but it's also making a powerful statement as well that independent film funded through crowdfunding and with a model based heavily on distribution and independent distribution is a viable alternative. Mm -hmm. And it's also from, well, you know, a blue collar part of Scotland as well that a lot of this activity is, you know, coming about. It's all about underdogs that are doing a bit better than they would normally be expected to. And I think this is the kind of independent voice that we should all be trying to yeah. support. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, 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 I think this is so important for people to realize that it is, this is really, truly grassroots filmmaking. Um, and that, it, that, that is so important because this is where the next generation, you know, the new generations of filmmakers are coming from. And as you say, when we're talking about the film, we are many projects, this is about encouraging young people, young filmmakers. Totally, because, you know, the market as it is, the industry in film is splitting you know, between Blumhouse and studio finance films and the alternative, which at the moment is a kind of smackering of hipster horror films that you might see, like the A24 stuff and other kind of independent efforts. And if you want those to be sustainable uh, and to grow, then that's really going to require filmmakers, I think, personally, to work with the fans uh, rather than try to integrate what, to the normal industry won't really be commercially viable projects. So uh, we're all in it together. If we want the horror genre to thrive and grow in, in a way that we want it to, yeah. then we've got to work together to make it happen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Okay. Laurie and Sarah, thank you very much indeed. Um, just before we sign off, um, I'd just like to give a shout out to everybody who's uh, subscribed to the YouTube channel. It really does help. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Next week, um, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be at the IMATS uh, exhibition with uh, talking about Hellraiser. I can't, still can't believe this is quite happening. Um, basically, I'm going to be uh, hosted by Paul Davis, who's previously been on the show. I'm going to be talking with Jeff Portis, Bob Keane, Cliff Wallace, John Cormican. I think I've got everyone apart from myself, which are basically part of Image Animation, the original makeup artists on the original Hellraiser um, uh, on the 30th anniversary of the uh, release of Hellraiser, on the year of the 30th release of Hellraiser. And we're going to be talking about that stuff at four o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday in London at IMATS. The following week, uh, I'm going to be talking with Paul Campion, the director uh, of The Devil's Rock, uh, and the, the, the feature film, which is really interesting, um, feature film set in a German bunker uh, in World War II, and plus his most recent short uh, short film, The Naughty List. So that will be at the end of May. And then after that, I won't be here for a couple of weeks because I'm going to be filming. I'm going to be shooting my films. And then the following week, uh, working with Paddy Murphy as a director and... Um, the rest of the gang must give shout outs to Barry Fahey and uh, Aaron Walsh as well, who looks after me so well whilst those are adult like out at Badger meet people. Anyway, uh, thank you very much indeed for watching. If you'd like to say goodbye, folks. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Chattering with Nicholas Vince. I've been talking with Sarah Daly and Laurie Brewster about their Kickstarter for the Black Gloves. Please go to Kickstarter. Look in, you know, type in the black gloves, really simple title. Support it. Let's bring this up to the you know, the level of production that these guys really want to be at. I will hopefully see uh, some of you um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, in the meantime, please take care of yourselves and goodbye. And now I have to hit the right.